Hi, everybody. Welcome to this opportunity. This, uh, sorry, let me start over. Hi, welcome to this community conversation, Stigma of Support and Strength in Men. We are here today with a panel of experts on the subject, and we really just like these conversations that we try to do every quarter to just kind of speak to different separate uh, communities, uh, different yeah, communities that may have disparities in healthcare and really why that is and what we can do as a society to help that. So I'm gonna go ahead and get out of here and give it away to you guys. Go ahead. Thank you, Annie. And thanks, Annie. Uh, Fred, do you wanna start us off? Start us off? Well, my name is Fred. I'm, uh, I was diagnosed with prostate cancer in uh, November of 15, went through a lot of testing. And previous to that, I hadn't been to the doctor in probably about 40 years, basically, except for stitches and things like that. But uh, I was supposed to be a donor for a brother of mine who was suddenly diagnosed with acute leukemia. I went down to the U and went through a lot of testing down there. My blood pressure was high. And uh, I went to my own doctor whom I had never met. I was listed as a patient of his. And I explained to him about this uh, high blood pressure. And I knew I had a enlarged prostate. Uh, he checked that and he gave me a little hint of what was to come. He said, if your PSA comes back high, you'll have to see a urologist. Well, yes. The PSA came back high, and I was no longer a candidate to be a donor for my brother with his acute leukemia for the bone marrow transplant. Uh, and subsequent uh, testing biopsy said, yes, you have prostate cancer, and here's the plan. The plan was uh, hormone treatment for three years, uh, to weaken and uh, shrink the tumor. And I started that uh, basically January 1 of 16. I started radiation, 44 shots of radiation. Took uh, 10 calendar weeks to get those 44 treatments in. Continued with the hormone treatment for a total of uh, three years of that. So I ended that uh, in 16 and the Hormone treatment continued on shots and a daily pill. And I'm, what, two years away from that, done with that. I'm feeling a whole lot better since then. My latest visit to the oncologist in February said, your PSA is still zero, less than uh, can be detected. And the term complete remission is listed on me now. And I get blood work again in six months, but I don't have to see the oncologist until one year. So hopefully that continues. So I've seen other people uh, that have much tougher circumstances than me. And yet other people look at me and say, boy, you had a tough time. It was a year after I completed the uh, radiation, roughly a year later that I stopped at Gilda's. I had seen a pamphlet in the uh, radiation waiting room and stopped in Gilda's and I've been a member ever since, actively doing yoga, I've done qigong, uh, things like that. I take part in the social aspects. I've attended lectures, uh, everything from acupuncture to uh, clinical uh, studies. Uh, and I sincerely appreciate the staff at Gilda's and the volunteers are amazing. It's been good for me. I have not taken part in a support group or anything like that. My support comes in the uh, social aspects, I guess. That's what really helps me. Uh, the yoga is a great, a great help also. It was surprising to me seeing an old fellow like me that says, yeah, I like this. I don't know what spurred me to sign up, but I did. And I have been going to yoga ever since. And that helps. And I meet some great people, not just the staff, other members. Uh, so that's where I'm at in my life right now. Awesome. Thank you, Fred. Um, 
Kevin, can you introduce yourself to the crew, please? Sure. Um, just over a year ago, I was diagnosed with stage four. It's uh, what the oncologist referred to as a funky cancer. It's a metastatic adenocarcinoma of unknown primary. Um, <clears throat> so the story with that one is I had a, a growth in the back of my mouth, which manifested itself as kind of a, uh, what I thought was a sore gum or maybe a popcorn hole stuck in there. And um, something that just kept bothering me, they super cleaned it for a couple of weeks in the dental office. They gave me some antibiotics and it didn't turn into a, uh, uh, anything that responded well to that. And so after a few weeks, um, it now is starting to take on kind of a growth form and look kind of ugly back there. So I got sent to a ear, nose and throat specialist quickly and it turned into a cancer diagnosis. Um, of course, the uh, shock was, was rough because I was just kind of in the process of taking a an early retirement path or a bridge uh, for my career as engineering um, into maybe part-time tutoring or something part-time to get me through. I'm in my late fifties and so wanted to work for a few more years part-time to um, get to a full early retirement maybe. Um, so the same week that I uh, put in my retirement um, notice for Honeywell, I got diagnosed that same week. So that's a rough week. Um, but the, uh, the immediate uh, attention was to try and figure out what was causing it and to see if there were other things within me that were also gonna be um, in the fight. And so it turned out after a CT scan that, that there was a mass in my chest as well and a little bit of spot, spot nodules in my lungs that were at least notable. And they said, well, okay, it looks like it's metastasized or maybe it started in your chest and went up to your mouth and into your lungs from there. Um, make a long story short, <clears throat> because it was in multiple spots, there was no good uh, surgical um, alternative. So they said, uh, how do you feel about chemo chemotherapy and radiation? Because that's, that's your best candidates. And so um, got going on that right away after we ruled a few more things out in my intestines. Oddly enough, the cancer seemed to have kind of a marker for um, gastrointestinal problems. They never found anything more there, but the, uh, the ultimate was to uh, try and figure out a way to combat this. And so by now, after the rest of March had, had evolved, um, that growth in my mouth was what I would refer to as um, an unnatural protuberance there. Um, being an engineer, I even came up with an acronym for it called AMP, um, abnormal mouth protuberance. <clears throat> and so they started working on that right away with some radiation. And um, right after that, on April Fool's Day, I started with chemotherapy. And so the, uh, the chemotherapy ran its course for five months and the radiation was just five sessions. But the good news was by the end of April, um, the growth in my mouth was saying uncle and receding back from whence it came. Um, so that one responded very well to early and direct treatment. Um, the one in my chest, um, it's been kind of up and down since then, and the nodules in my lungs have roughly expanded and decreased with some treatments, but that's still what I'm battling now. But getting rid of the one in my mouth was a major quality of life improvement. Um, I enjoy singing and enjoy, you know, eating, enjoy swallowing, enjoy breathing. All of those things appeared to be uh, somewhat in jeopardy at the time. So getting rid of that one was the big was the big thumbs up for, for the early, early part of the battle. <clears throat> After five months, the uh, chemotherapy, um, oxaliplatin and other uh, full fury kind of um, chemo drugs had kind of waned in terms of its effectiveness on the one in the chest. And so they decided to throw some radiation at that one, um, try to beat that one back a little bit. And, uh, you know, you kind of kind of trust the people that are pointing the 
point in the equipment if if your heart and lungs are right near there um, to uh, to get uh, to get that set where they where they want to. Um, but it was a combination of uh, precision in intake breaths and then um, you know hold your breath while they do the radiation kind of thing for ten more sessions. Ultimately, that that was pretty effective in at least. Um, beating down the, the one in my chest a little bit more. So that's helpful. Um, identified the oncologist um, in conjunction with uh, Mayo also identified a uh, targeted therapy drug, Ritevmo, that um, was a likely candidate because it had a marker, a genetic marker for one of the mutations in the, in the biopsy. So we ran that course for five months, um, ultimately decided that that was not as effective as we were hoping. And I recently began a regimen uh, last week to go back to a uh, backup chemotherapy. So I'm on uh, doses of that now every other week for three to six months at least, probably the CT scans about every quarter. Um, <clears throat> I joined Gilda's then in, um, about August of last year and decided that uh, in addition to the family support, the friends, the, the church, everything else I was leaning on that I should really get some more expertise on this um, and get some, get some other uh, assistance on this because there's a lot of new words and a lot of new things to go through. And Gilda's really filled the void for me because it, uh, it seemed like it was the best of um, what I was missing in terms of other help for my disease. Um, my mom was a nurse and so I speak a little bit of medical language from the home front. Um, she always said that, you know, you want good medicine, you want good doctors and you want good support. So that was the thinking there and I've uh, been very happy with <clears throat> the weekly support groups that I'm doing at Gildas. Annie is the facilitator of that one and um, also do a monthly chronic and monthly rare cancer support. And then uh, more recent, and I started doing the coffee chat, uh, ran into Fred there very quickly and, uh, and uh, enjoy, enjoy that group as well. Like he said, that's a, it's somewhat of a serious group, but it's also more of a social group that uh, kind of is all over the place for whatever people seem to need. And I think that's uh, one thing I've seen from the, from the uh, folks at the Guild is that everybody seems to have kind of a feisty um, determination. So getting a lot out of that. <clears throat> also, um, in the last few months, I've, I've joined the improv um, group on Wednesday. So try and laugh a little bit and do something goofy because that's way outside my comfort zone. But uh, it's, it's something that I'm enjoying. Um, maybe a little more now after a few sessions than initially, but uh, first it just scared the, scared the heck out of me, but uh, it's, uh, it makes you think and it's, it gives you something else to think about. And you know the diversity of programs at Gildas is really substantial. Like Fred says, you could do yoga, you could do meditation, you could do all sorts of things there. Um, so take, take the assistance where you can get it, I say. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, Kyle, I was wondering if you could introduce yourself next, please. Hey, everybody. And uh, thank you to Mr. Carlson and Kevin and Fred and Annie for, for having me here. And first off, it's inspiring to be on a panel with two guys who know how to uh, get support and know how to leave their comfort zone and do some yoga and some improv. That's bravo, guys. I, I've done the the improv too there. And you're right, Kevin, it's terrifying. <laughs> but if you can push through that, uh, what, a, what a cool experience. Um, so my story started in, uh, in 2011. Uh, my spouse was diagnosed with metastatic colon cancer. She was 34 at the time, I was 33, right after the birth of our second child. And we had some dear friends about a year into that that wanted to come spend a week with us. And they didn't really give us a choice too much. It was kind of like, we're coming. Um, kind of like my mom did. She's like, I'm moving in. Um, I was lucky to have people in my life that, that sort of forced support upon me. Um, 
as I, at that stage of my life, wasn't really ready for it, I don't think. Um, but they came and they spent uh, a week and at the dinner table that first night, they offered, um, you know, that, that they were there to serve me. And I didn't know what they were talking about. Um, I said, well, I'm not sick. Sarah's the one who has cancer. <laughs> you need to be serving her. Uh, then they went on to explain that before they came, they visited a dear friend of theirs who had lost his loved one to cancer. Um, his name was Jack. And um, his message to them was serve the caregiver. They're always forgotten. And um, so I was the first person to receive Jack's message. I went on to become the founder of Jack's Caregiver Coalition. And today our mission is to improve the way that guys think, feel, and act through every phase of their caregiving journey. And um, on, you know, honored to partner with Gilda's Club. We've held events there in that beautiful clubhouse many times, and I can't wait till we can do that again. Um, and you know, so actually fast forwarding to today, uh, we lost Sarah last summer uh, in July in the middle of the whole pandemic. Uh, she made it almost nine years. Uh, she got to see her boys uh, go all the way, almost all the way through elementary school and see the first day of kindergarten and many of the milestones she never expected to be able to see. So we were just so grateful uh, for all those opportunities. Um, and yeah, that's that's really my story in a nutshell. Thank you, Kyle. And in uh, a special thanks, uh, Kyle, Kevin, and Fred to the three of you for uh, being with me on this panel. I greatly appreciate it. And it was an honor uh, to be asked by Gilda's uh, to be a part of this. So I was happy to jump at it. My name is Dr. Mark Carlson and I go by Mark. I'm a licensed clinical psychologist and I've been connected with Gildas over the last few years. I um, am an international author and trainer and I do a lot of work in integrated care, which is the crossroads with mental health and physical health. And one of my specialty areas is in integrated care is working with individuals diagnosed with uh, cancer, uh, chronic pain and other conditions. So uh, when Annie asked me if I would be a part of this panel, I said, yes, right away. So again, thank you, Annie, and thank you to Gilda's and uh, Kyle, our paths have crossed a little bit in the past and I hope they will continue to do so. so you've got my cell phone, so don't be afraid to reach out and connect. So I'm happy to help if I can. Uh, what I thought we would do in this recording a, a little bit is I'll introduce uh, some ideas about what are pretty common reactions, situations, uh, things that get in the way of people kind of, uh, you know, reaching out and connecting with others and then what people have done to connect and how that's benefited them. So I thought that all of that would be some pretty good fodder for us to kind of talk about. And most of my uh, panel work in the past, you usually have an audience that you can see and reach out and kind of uh, feel out a little bit about really what's benefiting and what's like, yeah, come on, fast forward, dude. And we don't have that as a part of our experience here. So what we can all draw on is the expertise about why we were asked to be here in the first place. So I'll present some information and then Kevin, Fred, Kyle, if you guys feel free to jump in and kind of make it real, share, share your story or your Kind of reaction to things as we go. Um, one of the first things that I thought might be helpful to talk about is when there's a first diagnosis of cancer, whether that's for us or somebody that we're close to, it 
we tend to have some things that are kind of jogged in our world. And part of it is our identity, kind of who we are. And it's really interesting, you know, a lot of us are dads, sons, grandfathers, providers, we're professionals. Some of us are patients or clients. And one of the first things that's a challenge to us is who am I now where all of a sudden I have this diagnosis that I didn't ask for and I have a bunch of professionals who are now a part of my life that I didn't necessarily invite nor did I ever want or anticipate that I would be here. And there's a challenge to who I am because one of the biggest things that happens on the onset of a diagnosis is our quality of life changes and our functioning changes. And here, when we're talking typically about a first diagnosis, there's a lot of urges to kind of withdraw and kind of figure this out on my own, but yet kind of as the guys have talked about in their intros, is that this isn't an alone thing. You are with other people. And it's not like I can just hide forever, even though that I may have urges to withdraw. So I was wondering if you guys could talk a bit about your identity. Like, how did this change your identity as an individual, as a family member, as a supporter, whatever that might be? Because this is one of the things when people initially start coming in for services to professionals, this is where it's pretty wide open, where there's a lot of um, a lot of directions that can be presented with identity. And I was wondering if this is something that you guys can relate to. I'll mute and uh, turn it over to you guys. Um. I wondered why did this happen to me? I wasn't supposed to get this. I'm healthy, my family was healthy. Like I said, I hadn't been to the doctor for many years and uh, my wife's parents both died from cancer. And so her risk factor was much higher than mine. And here I am with the problem. And uh, she has outlived her parents by many years and uh, why did it happen to me? What did I do wrong? Did I, was my lifestyle, what triggered this? It's still unanswered, I guess. Uh, I had told my kids and I have two kids, a daughter and a son and told them the high number on the PSA it was way up there. My daughter works, uh, in healthcare, uh, she walked in and after the biopsy, she came for dinner one night and I said, yes, I am positive. Oh, I figure that much. Kind of matter of factly. And maybe that was a good lesson for me to treat it matter of factly that it's not a death sentence. As Mark said, uh, there's tremendous changes in the last, even since I was diagnosed and what I hear from other people with prostate cancer, different approaches uh, progress being made, although you still feel like a guinea pig. As Kevin said, they're trying this, they're trying that. You know, uh, it's amazing. And Kyle referred to you were there at a dinner and people came to support you. You know, why me? Uh, she needs it. And the first time that I went to a meeting, I'm fighting the macho thing, you know, I don't need this, I don't need that. And yet in the radiation waiting room, there's a little flyer or something on the table and it said, you're so intense living this treatment, the treatment team has become your family. Is this feeling normal? And I thought, you know, that really hits the nail on the head. And there was a meeting about the time of radiation, I think, and I went to that meeting just to see what was going on. I figured I could hide in the corner 
and just be quiet and listen to other people's stories. And I went there and there was oh, maybe five other people or so, a small group and nobody wanted to talk. I thought that's strange. Do I have to be the first one to talk? I'm supposed to be the one hiding. And I just opened up saying, I still have, you know, so many treatments a week and a half to go or something. I hope I get through them and related the intensity of it. My whole life is focused around being prepared physically for that radiation treatment. And you get in touch with your body in short order when the doctor says you must have a full bladder and an empty rectum. Well, that's an eye opener. You don't want to talk about these things, but you learn to- Everyone needs a hobby, huh, Fred? Yeah. And you get through it. You, I mean, this is your whole focus. You get through it. On the weekends, we would just go away for an overnight down to Owatonna or somewhere, just to try a different restaurant to try to maintain some semblance of normal, of sanity. But it was very, very intense. I tell you, it just becomes your whole life. And the farther I am from active treatment, the happier I am because the treatment is not necessarily just a breeze. We are, I think we are taught or maybe brainwashed by modern medicine. Give me a pill, make me well. Doesn't necessarily happen that way. But you focus on it, do what you have to do, I think is... So when I went to Gilda's, uh, like I say, it was almost a year later when I stopped in there and signed up from some classes. Uh, and I love the social things, I joke a lot. When I was getting the radiation, I messed with that radiation team almost every day. I mean, sometimes I would play a joke out, it took a week long before they would question me. They are so careful in not saying something that might offend you you know they use the word i said what's that towel for you lay it across your groin for your modesty i just laughed at that but some people some men yes it's a different story they are very very modest in a different way that i mean people see you in unflattering ways i guess and i didn't care about that i tease the people, you know. I remember one good joke I had. I asked the team one time and it was, you know, they call your name, you're ready for you. Yep, come on back. And they got a new sheet up on the table and the special mold for my feet to fit in. So I'm in the same position and you go in there quick, kick your shoes off, kick, take your pants off, hike yourself over to that table, climb up, pull your t-shirt up and your drawers down as far as they will go and get ready to be you know, situated and you do this all the time, 44 times a lot. I asked a gal one time, I said, you know, do you ever see your clients out in public? Oh yes, yes we do, but we wouldn't approach you. We wouldn't talk to you. But if you would talk to us, yes, we would talk to you. I said, no, 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 I'm just wondering in case I'm in a bar at happy hour and I turn and I see you and I reach and start taking my pants off, would you be offended? I, you know, conditioned response. and. Jeez. So that, I guess, was my approach and, and softening the reality of the intensity. Yeah. And Fred, I think you bring up a lot of really important points and aspects of things is that, you know, the cause of things, the why me, the why now, what did I do? the timeline of things of everything is so new up front and then it just becomes, this is just what I do. And then it becomes a big part of just who you are and how you carry it can be very different depending on your approach and your attitude and expectations. And I just made a note while you were talking, one thing that I'd like to I'll keep it open for Kevin and Kyle, of course, to talk about identity and impact. But one of the things that came to my mind was the concept of control. 
is uh, going to be a big one. So just to plant a seed that will come back around to that. But with the concept of identity, uh, Kevin, Kyle, was there anything that you uh, wanted to share with us? I think I remember, you know, when I got diagnosed with this, it was so out of the blue and it was such a rare cancer that, you know, there was really no prescribed um, approach to attacking it right away. And that was really frustrating for me as a, uh, you know, as a former engineer to be a problem solver and figuring, figuring out how do we attack this when, you know, it's not real obvious as to what the path's going to be. Um, but I realized that, well, I guess I can, you know, curl up in the fetal position and, and do nothing and, and uh, kick and scream for a while, or I can start doing something. And, and uh, so we just started, just started uh, heading in, in the treatment direction in the most likely uh, path and uh, trusted the doctors. They had consulted with uh, senior, senior oncologist at Mayo and, and said, uh, nope, nobody else down here at Mayo has ever seen anything like this exactly either. And, um, but here's our, here's our favorite approach. And they, they came to agreement on that. And um, I think jumping on it quickly was, was the right thing to do and, and uh, try to, uh, you know, get rid of that mess in my mouth was, was a key thing that really helped me early on. And uh, I think the, uh, the temptation is to just, you know, like if you're playing poker, five card draw, just throw the hand down and say, give me five new cards. Cause this, I don't want to play this hand. This is, this is no fun. Um, but it, to me, it just didn't seem like it accomplished anything to do that. Um, and I didn't sleep very well for a while, but, um, came to a, I think you described it as the acceptance mark or the fight or, or, um, the battle kind of thing where you just have to kind of dig in and, and, um, eat the elephant one bite at a time, so to speak. You know, you, you take on what you can and, and um, dig in. And I think that was my determination. Also started a caring bridge right away and got a lot of support from that too. That was, that was a big, big help. I think writing about it for me was, um, allowed me to kind of park some of those thoughts and get it off my chest so I could sleep at night. Well, and I wonder too, Kevin, if part of the engineer training that you've had to kind of problem solve, compartmentalize and take things step by step, if that kind of helped you with that aspect of things. I think so. Um, at least there didn't seem to be any, um, any reason to delay or to, uh, you know, get a second or third or fourth opinion when um, noted oncologists in the state, probably two of the best, didn't have uh, a whole lot more experience than the other in, in something like this. So uh, it just seemed to be the best thing to do to, to jump in and have that leap of faith that good things could happen. Awesome. Thank you. Kyle, did you have anything that you wanted to jump in on this one with? Yeah, for sure. I mean, <clears throat> I can remember before the diagnosis what, uh, you know, my identity was wrapped up in success. And so it was, you know, how am I measuring up? And the way I would know is conversations with my father and my stepfather, which were almost always about construction, because that was the business I was in. And how much was my raise? And did I get a promotion? And so I, the answers to those questions were usually, uh, you know, maybe or maybe not, or here's why. Um, and then once the cancer thing came along, it all got weird. Like that didn't make sense anymore to ask me about my promotion, right? Like, uh, and so to some extent, those conversations disappeared. Um, uh, my father-in-law became very distant and we just didn't talk at all because it was too hard for him uh, to talk about it all. Um, and so, yeah, it, and, and then, you know, the story I told of the, 
of the family coming with Jack's message. They're here to serve the caregiver and they're looking at me. That was almost a year into our journey and I had never heard the term. Um, I had been doing this for a year and I didn't know it had a name. Um, and I certainly didn't identify as a caregiver uh, at all. Um, it just perplexed me. Um, so that sort of started my journey on, you know, wrapping my head around what is this new role that apparently I'm already playing. Um, and, and so, yeah, you're, you're right, Mark. It, it's a very jarring, um, you know, something so fundamental as your identity and who you show up in the world as every day uh, for that to change um, is, is scary. Um, I think about Sarah and how she might answer this question. You know, she, she struggled with being a patient uh, versus a survivor. You know, she, some of these words were, were very, um, uh, you know, she, she changed over time how she identified uh, with, with having cancer. Um, we came to say that we both had cancer. Um, and she, she would say, I think, you know, later on in her journey, earlier on, she would say cancer didn't define her. Um, that was kind of this, like, I'm this rock, I'm this person that's, that's stronger than this disease. But as she grew to accept it, uh, she would say cancer did define her, but that was just one part of her. It wasn't her whole identity. Um, so it was kind of cool to see that, you know, change over the years and the months and years that she dealt with the condition. So I don't know that it's ever done, right? Like you're constantly wrestling with, with you know, who you are and, and how you're supposed to show up. Yeah. Well, and part of it, and thank you all for that. And I think part of this is it goes back to kind of what we want in the world and who we view ourselves as and who we view those around us to be and then having change occur that oftentimes we don't want to see. And it is, it can be very shocking and oftentimes unwanted. And when things become unpredictable, we tend to kind of withdraw and pull away. And that can be very challenging, whether it's uh, us who have been diagnosed or if we're part of somebody's support system is to try to understand that because things can be rocked to somebody's core foundation of who they are, things can get very unpredictable. And all of you touched on different aspects of things that I think are very important. But if we look at a common theme or a common thread that you all either referenced or talked directly about, is control, is that how can we get control? How can we get power? How can we get influence either back in our lives or wrestle to keep it? And I know that those are my words and, and a different way of phrasing part of your stories and part of your experiences that you have shared. But this is something that at least from my seat at the table that I see most everybody struggle with is I want to control it, but all I'm left with is the potential ability to influence it. And whatever it is, it can be the diagnosis, it can be the cause, the timeline, the influences of things, if there's a cure or not a cure. And I was wondering if you all would be willing to kind of share your frame of reference about that aspect of Control versus influence. I would say for me, <clears throat> there's with the uh, with the diagnosis came the realization that it wasn't going to be an easy journey, and there was going to be only a certain amount of control that we could exercise. Um, you know, let's just say that I had gotten, I, I use the example, my next cancer is going to be a real mild one. It's going to be a, one of these um, little skin blobs on the tip of my left elbow that you can whack off with an exacto blade over a lunch hour. Because this whole internal thing that, you know, 
invades you and gets in there and can't really be cured is a lot more to deal with. Um, if you can, if you can hit it with a prescribed regimen that um, has a 99% chance of success, that's a, a lot better position from a control and comfort standpoint to be uh, to be signing up for. But um, I think. Um, and early in my life, um, I've been type one diabetic for 34 years. Um, I kind of gotten that diagnosis out of nowhere. Um, but being the engineer type, um, I just treated it as an engineering problem and decided to try and become the best type one diabetic that I could be. And that remarkably has worked pretty well. Um, uh, recently, the, the technology has come further. And so now I'm wearing a continuous glucose monitor that really helps me geek out on, on my blood sugars and really bore people with, with a lot of extra data that they have no interest in. Um, I can't do that with cancer. I can't do that with, with this um, diagnosis. And, you know, I think um, we talk in some of the support groups sometimes about kind of living from CT scan to CT scan about every, about every quarter to see what's going on inside you. And that's that's a disconcerting feeling to know that uh, you could be the best patient, you could be the best person ever, and there are things beyond your control. That That's frustrating. Well, Kevin, you're right. That's uh, control, I think, goes along with trust. When I first got the word from the urologists, and he said, you know, here's the plan. You fall into this group, and he showed me a little chart type thing, but because this lymph node is inflamed, uh, you fall into this group, and guess what? The treatment plan is the same. And then we discussed whether or not surgery would be an option, and he said, no. I said, well, don't you have a late cabin to pay for? You're missing out on a nice big surgical fee. And no, this is the plan. I said, okay, now if I go see the radiologist and he disagrees and I go see the oncologist and he disagrees, who makes the decision? You know, there's disagreement among the team, you three. And they, well, the oncologist would make the final suggestion. And it's a matter of trust. As Kevin said, a second opinion or something, you know, get a second opinion. Some people told me that go get a second opinion. I said, well, you got three guys here, all top shelf, and they're all agreeing this is a treatment plan. So uh, I went with them. I totally trust them. And I know other people will do research and figure it out on their own. How can I do this? But I put my trust in the team and it has worked out so far. Uh, at the time, uh, surgery seems like a radical move to me. Like I said, I've had minimal appointments in the past with doctors, encounters, et cetera, through my life. And all of a sudden, looking back, I could probably add up probably 150 appointments. And it's some days you go in and there's three, you know, you got a bone scan here and oh, we're gonna leave that IV in because when you go upstairs for the CT, They'll need that for what they're going to do, you know, when they take a look at you. So looking back, I learned a lot. Initially, they throw so much information at you. It's confusing. You get through it, and then you talk to somebody else with their story, and they have different stories. There's a whole lot more out there. There's You can keep right on learning. I don't care to learn that much more about it. It's like... Uh, Gilda Radner says, you know, having cancer allows me access to a club I don't care to join. But it's reality. You do with it. Absolutely. Kyle, did you want to throw anything out there on control and influence? Yeah, I, I think Speaking of throwing things, it felt like throwing the steering wheel out of the car, you know, barreling down the highway and, you know, got two kids, just every, you know, and that's how it felt. And, and for a long time too, it wasn't like that was a moment in time. That was months and months and months. 
of that feeling. And I remember I kind of like Kevin's approach, like, okay, well, once I've figured out, okay, I'm a caregiver there, that's a thing I have a job to do. I'm going to be the best damn caregiver I can be. And, and I thought, well, I'm just going to figure it out. And um, unfortunately I had no idea what I was doing. Um, I s still would say to some extent that I don't, um, I have a, uh, one of my children is dealing with the healthcare borderline crisis at the moment. And so I have all these years of experience to call upon, but I still struggle with, you know, uh, vacations being thrown out the window, the uncertainty of caregiving that is you're living your life, um, as Fred and Kevin put it, scan to scan. Um, and, you know, those things are still like, it's not easy. It hasn't, it has gotten easier. Um, I do, and I, you, Mark, you mentioned influence versus control. Um, maybe that's what it is that I feel like maybe influence is uh, a better word to use because it, it's, uh, it's more achievable. Um, but yeah, it's, it's maddening, absolutely maddening to, to especially for, for those of us, I think guys tend to be more of the, the chain falls off the bike. We put the bike the chain back on the bike and we solve the problem. And so many of these problems are not solvable. Um, I remember Sarah, when we first found out her disease was metastatic and we came back into the clinic and our favorite nurse there, Nikki, um, who was just magical, <clears throat> who I was looking to to learn a lot from about caregiving. Um, she saw Sarah from across the clinic and she's like, what are you doing here? You know, you're done because we did the whole ring the bell thing and you know, you're out of here. And, and uh, Sarah just collapsed on the floor in a puddle of tears. And it still just breaks my heart to this day. Um, and mainly because I stood there like a horse in a pasture. I don't, I like to think hopefully I was holding her purse or something, but I don't even think I was doing that. And I was just so like, and that was another example of the steering wheel being thrown out the door. Like I didn't see that coming. I had no idea how to handle that situation, uh, but Nikki did. Nikki knew exactly what to do. She came running and she fell on the floor with Sarah and held her while she cried. And I, you know, but I, that's not, that's a, in a, just a story of barreling down the highway, completely unequipped and out of control, um, doing the best damn job you can do, but you're still just f coming up short um, and crashing into stuff, so to speak. So yes, control is, is absolutely um, so central to, to, you know, this, I think of it as uncertainty oftentimes, just like, okay, we're going to roll the dice. What the heck's going to happen today? You know, very frustrating. Yeah. I, one of the things that I uh, encourage people to talk about is I, I liken the concept of control is if I don't like what I'm experiencing it, like I'll talk as a dude for a second. If I don't like what I'm experiencing, I'm either going to fix it, I'm going to problem solve it, or I'm going to wish it into the cornfield or throw it out the window, kind of like what you were referencing, Kyle. And when we're looking at kind of chronic conditions or something that can be life-threatening or uh, certainly life-altering, is part of the acceptance piece of things is to acknowledge that there are just times where I don't have the power to do the things that got me this far in life. And it's like, so then Kyle, when you reference, I'm ill-equipped, well, that's difficult because nobody wants to be in that position where you're like, let me lead with my insecurity and vulnerability. Nobody wants that. And that's not what we seek out. And when we find ourselves there, uh, we use the term grabastic. It's let me just grab all over the place to move away from this. And I will do what basically ever I can 
to escape it, avoid it, or alter it. And those are three very distinctive places that people can get themselves not out of trouble, but further into trouble. And I don't know that there's a predictive way of saying you're going to do this. And I know that when we experience that, oftentimes a central theme is that concept of control, is that I don't feel like I'm in control. So therefore things are no longer predictable. I don't know what to do and now what? And, you know, the now what phase is, I know we'll be wrapping up in time here shortly, but the now what phase is there are resources that are out there. There are groups, professionals, other people. And what I wanted to share is this concept of duality and then ask the three of you to comment either on that concept of duality or how you've transitioned some of the stigma or myth of I'm less than, I'm damaged, and I need to kind of gut up and do this on my own. All three of you have shared in your experience that you've transcended that. You, you have gone beyond just I'm in this alone and you have found things to make things work for you. So first off the concept of duality and then what did you all do to kind of bridge that gap between you and the rest of the world so you're not going through something alone. Duality, when we're talking about a common condition is a very uh, common occurrence with chronic issues. Duality is that concept of I'm afraid and I'm going through something alone. This is idiosyncratic to me. Nobody has ever been named me that has gone through this before. So I feel alone, isolated, insecure, and I don't necessarily know what to do. I'm not, there hasn't been a class that I took on this. No one's trained me how to do it. Is there a right way to experience something? I don't want to do it the wrong way. And so we feel kind of insecure and alone, especially at that, we call it the two o'clock in the morning session, where at two o'clock in the morning, I'm sitting there, I'm alone, it's dark, and I'm left with my thoughts. And oftentimes my thoughts are not empowering. They tend to be very kind of self-destructive and partial truth, a lot of myth, a bunch of stigma that just makes my world shrink. But then there's that other side of that duality experience is that as soon as I share, have you ever had that two o'clock in the morning or do you feel this way or have you experienced this? People are like, oh yeah, I can relate. And we're like, well, really? I thought that this was kind of unique to me. There are unique aspects of our experience to us, that is absolutely true. But also the fear, the myth, the insecurity, the stigmas is what takes a lot of this and tells us, keep it to yourself because you don't want other people to know. And how empowering it is when you let somebody else in that can share part of your story, that can relate to something, or oftentimes even tell us, dude, that's crazy. <laughs> that's just you. And it's like, yeah, that's okay too, because that's the duality of that experience is that I have the right to have something that is just mine, but also other people are going to be able to relate to certain aspects of it. So I was wondering if you could all comment on that aspect or how you transcended those common barriers to reach out and get some support or make some connections that were healthy or meaningful for you. So I'll be quiet and turn this over to y'all. You know, going back to the day when I went to see the urologist for the results of the biopsy, and I fully expected to be told what he told me, that you have, you know, the high Gleason score and explained what that meant in my particular situation. And there's the plan. And 
set up more appointments with the radio or the oncologist first of all and the radiologist and some more tests and stuff you get back in your car and you drive home and you stop at the grocery store and the cashier said how's your day going they really don't want to know your problems and you're and it's kind of stunning you say well i hear this all the time and you automatically say doing okay doing okay going fine you know whatever in reality, sometimes you want to dump on them. And I did that one time, and part of my smart aleck attitude, I think I went in for my first Lupron shot, and the gal at the desk, a volunteer I assume, said, and how's your day going so far? And I thought, this is the time. And I leaned in and I said, well, except for the fact that I have cancer, and I'm here to get a shot in my ass that will chemically castrate me. I'm doing pretty good so far. Maybe it was a little mean, but it got it blew off a little steam. But then going on to this, you talk about, I mean, you, you don't really necessarily dump on people like that, but I've seen it so many times, the comments at, at Gilda's Club they get it there. There's other people that get it, they understand. And that opens up communication, you can talk to them. And sometimes you talk about details, other times you talk about generalities, but yeah, you can share things. And like I said, I didn't go to uh, support groups or whatever, but I would certainly encourage people to explore programs of support or social or whatever, just open up communications and go for it. It's out there, there's support. And Kyle, you sound like you got a tremendous program going there that you're offering help with to a lot of people. Get people to talk. It doesn't hurt guys, it doesn't hurt. Yeah, I, I think I <clears throat> my approach was at some point I just realized that I've got a bunch of resources around me. How can I focus and make the most of it? Um, you know, the old, uh, the old, the old saying, "Many hands, light work." Um, it, it did seem like it was a little bit lighter work if you shared the load and um, spread it around a little bit. And so, trying to take advantage of all of those you know, the core, what I call my A-team, the, the core family and friends that were with me all the time, um, the former co-workers, friends, neighbors, just take help from wherever you can get it and draw from that. And then, um, you know, with the, with the advancement of uh, all the programs at Gilda's, once I got into that, that, that really seemed like it uh, was a good, a good uh, collaborative effort for me. Um, Feel like you're not fighting it on your own and and you you just don't have to go through it um, without help and so that's a big thing you uh you dig in there and you know i started walking and so i started walking you know like <clears throat> when i could ten thousand steps a day and so i started getting walking partners and getting other people involved and pretty soon i had a kind of a regular crew of of four or five people I could go walking with. And, you know, sometimes we would talk about whatever, and sometimes we would just talk about the weather, but uh, getting that support group lined up and, you know, like Kyle's extended family and, and his, uh, his team that helped support him and the whole family was, you know, I think that same kind of idea. It really, it really feels like you're, you're all pulling, you know, pulling the boat in the same direction, so to speak, and, and kind of moving, moving and making progress. Yeah, I, <laughs> again, this hits home really hard, Mark, um, the, the, the insecurity, the, the isolation early on. I mean, good Lord, I, I know now about myself, I'm a raging extrovert. Um, but back then, I don't think I really understood that about me and and how I let myself get just, you know, I turned inward and just, you know, isolated and just worked harder, you know, just try to keep doing the same things and get different 
results and it just you know it got me to a really dark place i remember i broke down in a hotel room on a on a work trip one time and i just stopped going to the conference and i just wrote and wrote and wrote in my hotel room and cried for like three days straight and just finally you know came to terms with what i was going through and um and came out of that like committed i'm gonna find someone to help and um that's like me i'm gonna find them and so i did i tracked them down and uh, justin is one of our co-founders and he was in a very similar situation and and so my way of of connecting or you know feeling less alone was just how can i help this person and pay forward the the help that i received um and that changed everything like that i remember the first time we met in in uh at lucky 13s in bloomington right across from best buy uh it was like first it was weird because it was like this blind date i didn't know what he looked like i'd heard about him um and then it was like the best blind date ever because we had a bajillion things in common and holy cow it was like oh my god we need to do this like every week and he's like well how about once a month okay once a month <laughs> um but it was and i think people like gilda's experienced that i think people at jack's experienced that it's you know you there's no greater teacher than experience than when you have been surrounded by people who have been or are in your situation it's indescribable you know fred and kevin and i can sit here and try to describe it to you uh, but trust us whether it's improv or it's you know a support group or it's jacks i don't i don't know that the activity itself matters as much as who shows up and and uh you know going at this alone is tragic it's absolutely tragic and especially with such a robust community of support that is there now, right? Like even eight years ago, that even in the Twin Cities, it wasn't here at all. Or, you know, you could find it at church, you could, you, you could find community, but um, we have such a rich community now. I, there's absolutely no reason anyone should go through this alone. Awesome. Well said, everybody. Um, you know, one of the other things that one of the last things that I wanted to propose to everybody was, uh, you know, 20, 2020 has been, was very challenging. And now into 2021, we have different ways that we all experience, um, support connection, and there are so many uh, supports out there right now that are like this. They're linked through Zoom or some other media. And, you know, we look at uh, Gilda's, Jack's, uh, mental health systems. You're, there's a lot of options right now for individuals to reach out that there are pros and cons to what we're finding now is uh, virtual versus in-person. And I was wondering if you guys could comment a bit about that because in-person, it allows us to really kind of read the room, get, get the vibes, kind of connect with somebody where you can just have that nod where you just look at each other and you get it. You, you don't have to put words on it. And sometimes when you're in a situation like that, words can cheapen things. And it's like, you just get that human connection. Uh, but yet there are times where because of our health, our uh, schedules, whatever that may be, we may not be able to get somewhere in person or because of uh, the risk factors of whether it be COVID or uh, different treatment regimens and um, uh, aspects of that that kind of put me at risk. And so maybe remote connection is one of the safest, best, easiest ways to reach out and get support. And if I don't wanna talk, I can hit mute and you can't make me. You can stare at me as much as you want and I can click off a gallery view and I don't have to see you staring at me. And so there are pros and cons to being in person. There are pros and cons 
to connecting remotely. I just was wondering what your takes are right now where we find ourselves in April of 21 going, we have options, but yet are those options really something that we want to pursue? Is, are there more barriers because of this or less barriers for me potentially reaching out or accessing things? So just wondering what your take is on that because I know at mental health systems, we have about 60 to 65% of our clientele want to be seen in person. They do not want to connect remotely because they look at that and say that, you know, and this is their feedback to us, what they want us to know is that I am much more comfortable knowing that people are in a similar situation to me when I get to sit next to them and I can just feel it or read the room. But yet I've also got 30 to 35% of our clientele where they're like, this is a gift because I've got kids, a job, I'm trying to juggle this and I don't have to worry about a commute. I can just log on, I can do my jam and then I'm done. It saves me exponential amounts of time. And I just have to make sure that I meaningfully engage everybody on the screen. And I know that they're there, but then there's also the hybrid models of, yeah, we do need to meet in person, but remote uh, at certain amounts of time is acceptable, but we still have to have that in-person meeting to really have that connection to where I know media can spread that connection. So just wondering kind of what your take is on this, because I think that uh, there's some definite positives that come from this, but it also really does stretch relationships is what we're hearing. Well, that's a new reality. See, I was doing in-house at Gelda's. I'm lucky enough to live just five minutes away so I can buzz over there in short order. And regularly, I've met many good people online uh, that live on the other side of St. Paul. It's very inconvenient for them to drive all that way for one one hour class or something. But the reality of uh, virtual has helped them a great deal. In person, like you say, you can read the room. I can feel the energy. I could relate some cases where you could almost physically see the energy of the room, the group reaching out and giving somebody a hug with their energy in the healing aspects was astounding. Uh, I'm familiar with healing touch. I've had acupuncture and you know other uh, healing type things. And I'm open to that. I think that's a great idea to offer those. I was very, very happy when I saw my oncologist who to me is a very straight arrow guy to see him at Gilda's breakfast where they talked about other things than just the AMA approach. So uh, I would say that the uh, virtual online stuff is 85 to 90% as good as meeting in person for me. To some people, it's the new reality. This is what they've done. I think, Kevin, I met you only online. And that is, I'm looking forward to meeting you in person and saying, hey, here we are. What do we do? Like a blind date, like Kyle said. Yeah, for me, I, you know, I got diagnosed last March. And so by the time, <clears throat> you know, I was even close to ready for any kind of uh, Gilda support was, you know, maybe five months after that, four or five months after that. And I started saying, okay, I can take a breath. I'm, I'm through the, what I consider the crisis and, you know, I need some support now. And, uh, and um, I've only done the online experience, of course. Um, I guess <clears throat> speaking as a, as more of an introvert type, um, 
I, I certainly have seen the advantages of being a forced or a temporary extrovert um, when advocating for yourself and, and when, when helping other people go through things. Um, the old joke, you know, if you're, an, if you're an extroverted engineer, you might look at somebody else's feet when, when you're in the elevator instead of your own. Um, that's, that's sort of, a, sort of one of those things that, uh, um, I think I've always, I've always felt the value of close relationships and have had longtime friendships with, with people and family members that, you know, in person is just the best way to be there, um, to give that person a hug or to let them know that you're there in body, mind, and spirit. And, um, I think that's clearly the way to be in the perfect world, but um, at least for me with, with um, being rather needy in, in terms of trying to get some additional cancer help, um, I really valued the, the online Zoom uh, relationships that I've, all these people that I've met and, and grown close to, um, never having met them at all. Um, it's it's one of those things I think that as long as you are plugged in, um, you're there to, to help them, you're here there to um, sometimes just let people dump, um, to say whatever they, they want to say in a safe environment and uh, helpful, you know, positive, kind of that feisty determined attitude toward problem solving. And I think that's, that's worked well for me um, to hear the hope in people, you can get that through Zoom. You can you can uh, probably do more of that um, in person, but in some regard, it might be a little easier to talk um, and really get into those feelings uh, sometimes when you're by yourself um, and not have to be see the see the looks on people's faces all the time and and to try and feel like you. Um, have to overcome all your emotions perhaps to uh to do that so i think there are pluses and minuses to <clears throat> to both uh, both approaches and i think that will will likely continue from what we've learned from this last year yeah i would just add to what fred and kevin said yeah it's it's everybody has their own style and and the way that they communicate the way that they prefer to hear. Um, one of the things that got me through this far through the pandemic is this thing. You can call people with it. Like, I just figured that out. Like, you can just call people and talk to them. It's a phone, too. <laughs> and I just love it. Like, there's on my walks, I just call, I just start calling people and catching up with them. I think some of what's happened in this virtual world, at least for someone like me who, who's living in it a lot, um, is what we miss is these little these little side conversations we would have before a gathering started. And it was just, hey, you know, it was a 20, 30 second little exchange, but it was so important. And now we're having to be more intentional about um, chasing that stuff down because we, Early on, uh, our, our virtual programs would be, we just basically took the in-person thing and made it virtual. So if it was a two hour thing, it was a two hour thing online. Well, quickly we learned like, okay, two hours online is too much and you gotta, and the reason it was two hours in person is because of those little, those little conversations before and after. Um, and so I think that's what, for me, is is why I wouldn't agree with Fred. I wouldn't say eighty five percent virtual. I'm I'm more of a maybe forty <laughs> percent kind of guy. The virtual stuff is hard uh, for me um, to feel. Like I think it's good for knowledge transfer. We can exchange knowledge and tips and tricks and strategies. But when it comes to emotional support and building relationships, I really I need the blood heat of the people with me. And, and I need to hug them and I need to feel them. And, um, and I feel like that's how I can also offer support. You know, when somebody's sharing something that's just really hard is just to grab their shoulder. And um, I don't think that can be underestimated the power of that, to feel tangibly connected and to actually be 
connected. And but I think going forward, more than likely, uh, I won't speak for Gilda's or or your organization, Mark, but I think most organizations are going to lean into the virtual space. Uh, maybe not as hard, but we know that especially for those that are just trying to get through every day, yeah, it's huge um, to just hop on a on a call and save those miles on on your life and and so i think it's it's how do you and and we'll we're all here in whatever way you want to reach out to us call us email us <laughs> we'll chat with you on a text whatever your style is we don't there isn't one right way to reach out or ask for help that whatever way that you feel comfortable with our organizations are gonna be there and we're going to show up for you in that way. You're not, we're not going to force you to get on a Zoom meeting if that's not what you what feels right to you. Yeah, that's some really good points, Kyle. Um, for my agency, one of the things that we're doing, as soon as we went virtual, uh, which was before the state shut down the first time last year, was we started tracking uh, people's choice and effectiveness and what works and what didn't. And we've been tracking and creating metrics on this. So when people ask, well, I don't know what I need. And it's like, because that's pretty common. Is like, okay, well, let's share with you. Here's what a thousand people who are going through something similar to you this is what they've found. And it gives people a little bit of a frame of reference because uh, one of the things that I could geek out with you all for a long time on is how do people learn? Because we have to learn how to give and receive support because I'm not quite sure we're all programmed for that is to, we just wake up one day and we just understand hey, this is exactly how I work and how I function, you know, that's usually not people's experience is that we have to try stuff. We have to figure it out. And I think that there's going to be a balance over time that people are going to find. It's kind of like, I love pizza rolls. And so it's like, if all I did was eat pizza rolls, eventually I'm going to get sick of pizza rolls and I'm not going to love them anymore. And now the thing that I really wanted, I don't want anymore. And that's oftentimes, I think, what's really going to happen here with how we give and receive support is there's going to be quite a bit of trial and error. But I think we're going to naturally go with the way that we've learned that we get our needs met, is that it's going to be somewhat idiosyncratic to everybody about what your formula is, but everyone's going to have a formula. And if we think about normalcy, there's going to be some people that are only in person. That's how it's got to be. Only way I can get my needs met. On the other end of that same spectrum is going to be, okay, virtual only. That's, that's where it's at. And most of us are going to be in that middle ground going, well, I can do some of each, but my preference of getting my needs met moves in this direction a little bit more, this direction a little bit more, and giving ourselves that flexibility of, my needs are also going to change over time because as I adjust to the world, as I adjust to my diagnosis, as I adjust to my family, as a um, patient or caregiver, whatever that might be, my needs are going to change over time. My hope is, is that while we have this window available to us, that because of the, uh, more ease of accessibility through technology that we can cast the wider net to get more people connected. And once we get people connected, let's then find out what the magic formula is for each individual. So then as providers, not only could we connect with more people, but we can stay connected to them for that support, that information transfer, whatever that might be. So I think, I think it's going to adjust back. I think as medical professionals, 
we're going to follow the codes and follow uh, ideas and data, and that's going to shrink the availability potentially of some online services, but also some online services are going to have data and be able to expand. So I think that we're gonna be really uh, just out of necessity in an area where it's going to be very difficult to predict for a period of time. But once the dust, dust starts to settle, individuals, we're, we're still social beings. And to go back a little bit to Kyle, some of the stuff that you referenced is, and you know, Fred, what you talked about with some of the in-person stuff is that, uh, and Kevin, you referenced it as well, just to have that immediate availability to be able to share connection. We're human beings and we don't have a necessary genetic code to do only things remote to be able to give and receive connection. And I don't know what that formula, like I referenced before, is going to be, but for what my field tells us is if it's patients, professionals, human beings, we do need to connect. We do need a group. We do need people to understand we do need people to meet some of the needs that we can't meet for ourselves. And I would caution people, if you're 100% online, that can be okay for a period of time, but you do need to come more toward the center at times to be able to get that human connection as well. And for those who are, I just want human connection only, well, let's have some availability of that flexible aspect to be able to say, well, during this time, I do need to use um, technology to my benefit to make some of those connections. So if we can learn something for what the data is already telling us is that taking a rigid view of being too extreme and that there is only one way, it's going to lead to isolation. And so if we can find that balance and find our own way through this, there are other people like us to make those connections. So if you're starting in person, understand that there's more access to remote services now. If you're starting remotely, know that there are hybrid ways to get your needs met that still involve person to person and group connection. So please be flexible, please seek us out as caregivers and providers, we are there for you. And as members of support groups, people are just waiting to be heard and finding ways to connect. So isolation is a very dangerous place to be at times, but also putting all of your eggs into only one basket, whether it be one end of the spectrum or the other, can also lead to isolation and to very unique challenges and very unique ways to find that your functioning is being compromised as well as your quality of life. So again, balance, find that balance in what's right for you because chances are there's other people seeking that same balance. Um, I just wanted to show you something. I have a ton of other areas to address, but I think that's probably different topics uh, and different ideas for a different time. I wanna honor everybody's time commitment. And again, just to cycle and circle back, uh, Kyle, Fred, Kevin, it's been an honor being on a panel with you. I really appreciate what you shared, your insights. I know that uh, for just what you shared, it will help me both personally and professionally moving forward. So thank you for the risk of being a part of a panel and uh, sharing today. And Annie, thank you very much for the opportunity that you afforded um, myself and hopefully everybody else to be on this. And I hope our paths continue to cross moving forward. So uh, Kyle, Fred, Kevin, I will turn this back over to you if there's anything else that you guys wanna end with and then 
Annie, when they're done, I'll turn it back to you. So thanks everybody. I would just like to make an end comment that uh, there are times and I've seen it, you're having a down day, you get some energy from other people, other days, you can help the people that are giving you energy because they're having a down day and it's okay to laugh and it's okay to cry. Yeah, I absolutely agree. You've got to be able to uh, <clears throat> put yourself out there. And uh, despite the, the mood you come in with, um, you just about always will get something out of a, an exchange if you're actively listening and, and compassionate and empathetic for others. Um, I think when my, uh, when my mom was suffering after my dad died in his 50s, um, one of the nurses said that um, the goal of the, of the support team at the hospital was to kind of link their hands together and lift her up. And, you know, if everybody throws in a finger or a thumb or a, a part of a hand or something like that, uh, you make sure that no one slips through the cracks and you make sure that you, know, you can do what you reasonably can to help people, um, whether you're inside the hand or outside the hand on that given day. Yeah, I would echo uh, what Kevin said in that we believe caregiving is a team sport and that uh, if any of you guys are out there going at that alone, um, you, what you're trying to do is be the magic all yourself. Uh, and I can tell you that's exhausting and it's a, it's a dead end game. Um, so get help, whether it's, it's from Mark's group or Gilda's or Jack's, I don't think it matters as much. Um, and then to your point, Mark, about uh, getting, you know, leaning too hard one way or another, I think you're exactly right. It reminds me of how we all kind of, we tend to, even my family, we sit at the same seat at the dinner table. And we get stuck in that routine, right? Like we don't even know maybe that we're doing it. And I think it's good to everyone once in a while to say, hey, let's all sit in a different seat. Um, let's look at this thing from a different perspective. And when that comes to engaging uh, with support, you know, let's try to try to find something else. If you've been doing uh, the yoga, try the improv, you know, um, you just mix it up. And because there could be something that works even better for you. Um, we've been, <laughs> I can tell you that we've done a, a clay shoot. Uh, we do fire pit Fridays now. Um, we're, we're looking at a tank driving experience in June. Um, and I can tell you that it is magical when you see people in person again, if you're anything like me. And cause it's like, oh my God, look how short Kyle is. I thought he was tall. <laughs> like you just get a whole new, uh, and so I just strongly encourage, uh, you know, to, to think about the, and, and while, you know, honoring the safety that your loved ones require um, and, and also knowing it's going to be a little bit weird. Like I remember I, I went in for a handshake and a hug on someone and I was like, oh God, that's really bad, <laughs> but I didn't, you know, it's just an old habit. And uh, so there are still those awkward, like in-person things that can happen, but um but yeah, leave your comfort zone and, and don't try to be the magic all alone. <laughs>